This episode is sponsored by Curiosity Stream. Sign up at the link below to get a month entirely free and stay tuned to the end to find out about a new bonus that you get with your subscription as well. I've long wanted to share the amazing story of two overlooked but vitally important men in the history of cardiac surgery. Two men whose employers have become household names. Two men whose stories have remarkable parallels despite being on different continents. And as October is Black History Month, I thought it would be the perfect opportunity to finally get this video made. Hamilton Naki was born into a poor family in the Eastern Cape region of South Africa in 1926. He attended school until the age of 14, but then was forced to look for work, traveling to the big city to work as a gardener at the University of Cape Town. I came to Cape Town to look for work because my family was very poor. I couldn't manage to go to school. I take Standard 6. Now from Standard 6 I came here to work to the gardener. For years he tended to the grounds, rolling the tennis courts diligently. This was at the exact period in history when South Africa really embraced apartheid, an institutionalized policy of Baskup, white supremacy. So a stable job gardening in a university was the best many black men could hope for. However, pioneering heart surgeon Robert Gertz enlisted Naki to help him in his animal laboratory. In those days it was quite common for university medical labs to have dogs kept on site for research. His duties started as cleaning of cages and looking after the animals, but his keen intelligence and ability to learn quickly meant before long he was assisting Gertz anaesthetizing the animals for surgery. Soon he was performing surgery himself, including dissecting a giraffe's neck to find out why they don't faint when they lift their heads up from the ground. Gertz left the department for Germany, but luckily for Naki, Christian Barnard, the man who would go on to perform the world's first human heart transplant, and who had just returned from the US where he'd learned many novel surgical techniques, recruited Naki to assist him. Barnard was so impressed with his remarkable skill and dexterity, he duly appointed him principal surgical assistant of the laboratory. Barnard would go on to call Naki one of the great researchers of all time in the field of heart transplants. He helped Barnard perfect heterotopic or piggyback heart transplants as well, where a new heart is implanted into the chest without removing the old one. Naki then made a move into liver transplantation, an even more technically challenging field. Over the years he became a key tutor to the doctors themselves, instructing junior surgeons in techniques that he had refined. And uh, I could see that he was a very capable young man, and uh, I gave him do more and more and more, and eventually he could do a heart transplant, sometimes better than the junior doctors came there. Testimonials include those from Rosemary Hickman, transplant surgeon whom Naki assisted and taught in the laboratory and who worked with him for almost 30 years. Despite his limited conventional education, he had an amazing ability to learn anatomical names and recognize anomalies. His skills ranged from assisting to operating and he frequently prepared the donor animal, sometimes single-handedly, while another team worked on the recipient. He was also probably unique in once assisting with a delicate hepatic arterial anastomosis while gently rocking my baby's cradle. Del Kahn, head of Rotescure's hospital organ transplant unit, the site of the first heart transplant whom Naki also taught, a liver transplant on a pig in the US would involve a team of two or three medically qualified surgeons. Hamilton can do all this on his own. Ralph Kirsch, head of the Liver Research Center at the University of Cape Town said, he was one of those remarkable men who really come round once in a long time. As a man without any education, he mastered surgical techniques at the highest level and passed them on to young doctors. And Christian Barnard himself. Now a liver transplant really is a very difficult surgical procedure. And he learned this too, in that he, today he can do heart transplant and he can do liver transplant. I can't do liver transplant, but he can. You have to remember what a deeply divided time this was. Naki never operated on humans, but he wouldn't have even been allowed to touch a white patient at the time Lever side entered the operating theater. Even the first heart transplant, despite being in an overwhelmingly black country of South Africa, was between two white patients to avoid any controversy. As a result, Naki's achievements were not well known during his career. When he retired in 1991, he received a gardener's pension of $275 a month. I undertook a period of my medical studies in Cape Town and visited the Heart of Cape Town Museum, where Hamilton Naki's accomplishments are celebrated alongside Christian Barnard's. A decade before I visited, Naki had belatedly been recognized by the government with one of its highest civilian honors and an honorary degree from Cape Town University a couple of years before he died. 
And just two years ago, the area outside the Christian Barnard Hospital was renamed Hamilton Naki Square. Hamilton Naki's story has remarkable similarities to that of American Vivian Thomas, whose achievements are even more impressive. It was not until years after his death that his work became well known, but in 2004 his life was dramatised in the excellent movie Something the Lord Made, starring Moss Def and the late great Alan Rickman. I really recommend it. Born in Louisiana in 1910, Thomas was the grandson of a slave. An intelligent student, he had hoped to become a doctor, but the Great Depression scuppered his plans as he saw his meagre finances obliterated. Instead, he got a job as a lab assistant to Dr. Alfred Blaylock at Vanderbilt University, another towering figure in the history of cardiac surgery. He quickly showed not only his surgical skill when operating on dogs, but his ingenuity when developing new techniques and original medical thinking. It was to prove a perfect fit for Blaylock's iconoclastic style. The two would achieve great things. Their work shone new light on mechanisms of hemorrhagic shock and crush injury, which would go on to become crucially important on the battlefields of World War II. Blaylock was one of the world's first surgeons to attempt to operate on babies' hearts, up till then considered almost impossible. He became a forerunner in the field and was offered the position of Chief of Surgery at Johns Hopkins, and he demanded Thomas accompanied him. Thomas relocated his family to Baltimore and faced a culture shock, a level of racism to which he was not previously accustomed. Excuse me. All workers punch in at the rear entrance. He's with me. That don't make any difference. Do you know who I am? No, sir. <clears throat> I'm Dr. Blaylock, Chief Surgical Professor. Well, I'm sorry, Dr. Blaylock, but that's the rules. I'll meet you in the labs, Vivian. The only black employees were janitors, and indeed, despite by this point already performing the work of a postdoctoral researcher, he was classified and paid as a janitor. At points he would even seek extra income by working as a bartender at Blaylock's parties, often serving drinks to junior doctors he had been teaching earlier the same day. Pediatric cardiologist Helen Tausig approached Blaylock to ask if he could help her tackle the devastating Tetralogy of Fallow, colloquially referred to as Blue Baby Syndrome. As an aside, Helen Tausig herself was a remarkable figure. The founder of the field of pediatric cardiology, she went deaf quite early in her career, and hearing is perhaps more valuable to a cardiologist than any other doctor, especially in those days, because listening for heart murmurs with a stethoscope was how diagnoses were made. They didn't have access to all the fancy scanners that I have today. Instead, Tausig learned to use her hands placed on a child's chest to detect a cardiac abnormality, which is just crazy. She also led calls to ban thalidomide, which caused a generation of babies to be born with limb deformities. Tetralogy of Fallow is a complicated problem, but essentially not enough blood reaches the lungs. It was almost uniformly deadly, with only the mildest cases allowing the child to live more than a couple of years. The first challenge was recreating the disorder in dog test subjects, something that had never been done. Thomas not only managed it, but he was then able to turn a vague idea that Tausig had of replumbing pipes into practice. The pulmonary artery is constricted in the main artery before the divide diminishing blood supply to both lungs. And the hole in the septum causes the used blood to flow back into the arterial system instead of flowing through the lungs, turning the baby's blue. The baby's heart is delicate. It's a goddamn minefield. The first step is to see if we can create the blue baby condition in a dog and then come up with a plan to solve it. Tausig had noticed that babies with something called a patent ductus arteriosus in addition to tetralogy of fallow did better. The ductus arteriosus is a connection between the artery supplying the body, the aorta, and the artery supplying the lungs, the pulmonary artery. We all have an open ductus arteriosus whilst we're in the womb and we're not using our lungs. But once we're born and we take a breath, it should close. When it doesn't, it's called a patent ductus arteriosus. The babies that had a patent duct seemed to have fewer problems. So Thomas created a shunt, a new connection, between one of the arteries that supplies the arm, 
and diverted flow to an artery supplying the lungs, meaning more blood would now pass through the lungs to pick up oxygen. When Blaylock inspected the meticulous work Thomas had performed on these small and delicate vessels, he said, Are you sure you did this, Vivian? This is like something the Lord made. Without a medical degree, of course Thomas could not operate on a human. But here you can see him guiding Blaylock over his shoulder, at Blaylock's request, when he first performed the procedure on a patient. The operation was a revolution in the treatment of Blue Baby Syndrome. Blaylock and Tausig's names were celebrated the world over. It became known as the blaylock tausig shunt. And that's certainly the name that I learnt when I was at medical school. However, I now more accurately refer to it as the blaylock thomas tausig shunt And there has been a move within Kydex Surgery to do the same, to acknowledge the fact that his contribution was equal to that of the other two, although things change slowly. Thomas became a figure of legend in Hopkins. Even if you'd never seen surgery before, you could do it because Vivian made it look so simple, said Denton Cooley, another great name in surgery. There wasn't a false move, not a wasted motion, when he operated. I enjoy this chapter in my specialties history because it shows how three trailblazers came together to save lives. A man, a woman in a man's world, and a black man in a white man's world. Despite earning tremendous respect from his peers, Thomas's career was somewhat bittersweet. After his death, his widow revealed that he clung on to the faint hope of studying to become a doctor well into his 40s. In 1976, Johns Hopkins presented him with an honorary doctorate. It had to be in laws, as opposed to medicine, owing to his lack of education, but it meant that his colleagues and his students could then refer to him as doctor. Before his death in 1985, some of his students, once ascended to senior ranks themselves, commissioned a portrait of him that hangs on the wall in the Alfred Blaylock Medical School, next to a portrait of Blaylock and Anna, one of the first dogs Thomas successfully performed a Blaylock Thomas Tausig shunt upon. Another person of colour that taught one of science's legendary names is John Edmonston. Originally a slave from Guyana, Edmonston learnt taxidermy from pioneering conservationist Charles Waterton and assisted him in the Amazon. When he was freed, he travelled to Edinburgh where he taught his taxidermy skills to students of biological sciences, including a certain Charles Darwin, with whom he shared stories of the natural wonders of South America. Edmonston is mentioned in Curiosity Stream's novel take on Darwin's life. I'm interrupting this sponsor read with an entirely different microphone because I've got some breaking news. As of this week, if you sign up for Curiosity Stream for only $2.99 a month by visiting curiositystream.com medlife and using the code medlife, you now also get a Nebula membership included. Curiosity Stream, you probably already know, they've been a huge support to this channel and have thousands of high quality documentaries to choose from. For those that haven't heard me talk about Nebula before, it's a new streaming platform made by creators like Wendover, Real Engineering, CGP Grey, Minute Physics, Kuzgesagt, and even Little Old Me. Two of my recent videos that I was really happy with, the Frankenstein one and the one about two-headed dogs, were slammed by the YouTube algorithm as they dealt with some controversial topics and those videos have performed really badly. And that's one of the reasons we created Nebula, to allow educational creators to make the videos that they want and the ones that you want to watch without having to worry about punitive effects from the algorithm and demonetization. You can find Nebula Originals from some of your favourite creators already there, and my first one will be going up in about a month or so as part of a really interesting series where different creators examine opening sequences to their favourite TV shows. And of course, I'm starting with House. So that is membership to both Curiosity Stream and Nebula for only $2.99 a month by signing up at the link below and using the code MEDLIFE. Rest assured, none of us, certainly not me, are planning on leaving. YouTube will continue to make videos available for free. However, you know as well as I do that all the crap that YouTube pull, so teaming up with a really fantastic organisation like Curiosity Stream is not only very exciting, but it feels like a taste of the future. And as if all that wasn't enough, if you sign up today, you get your first month absolutely free. I am a Patreonic, so as always my request is to go sign up, because that means you'll not only be supporting me to continue making videos, 
but you also get access to all those excellent and importantly trustworthy documentaries on CuriosityStream, and for the first time you'll also have access to Nebula as well. So do that rather than giving me money directly, because I'll just spend it on hash browns.